the rise of Khrushchev, 1953 to 1958. The United States was saved from the consequences of this short-sighted and ignorant policy by two factors. <clears throat> a. The Soviet Union had no intention of risking any direct clash with the U.S. And B. The Soviet Union during most of this period was in the midst of an intense and to internal struggle which made it po impossible for it to follow any course of sustained aggression. At the end of the war, Stalin's rule in Russia was as firmly established as it had ever been. He was head of the government as well as leader of the Communist Party and with the army completely subordinate to his will. The army played only a small role in domestic politics of the country. But Stalin had shown his power over it in the Great Purge of 1937 when he had destroyed at least 5,000 of its officers on falsified charges of disloyalty. The survivors were under close scrutiny, both from secret police units established for security reasons throughout its organization and from the party commissars attached to its major units. The secret police under the Ministry of State Security was a state within a state with its own armed forces including armored divisions and completely autonomous air units. It controlled millions of prisoners and slave laborers, large industrial enterprises, and wide territories, chiefly in northern Asia. Stalin was exempt from the authority of these secret police and at the same time had his own secret police powers within the party organization because the party statutes of 1934, prepared by Lazar Kaganovich, had given him an independent police apparatus for use within the party. This was controlled from the, his personal secretariat under Lieutenant General A. N. Poskrebyshev. The party, like the police, had units originally called cells in almost every industrial enterprise in many collective farms and residential neighborhoods and rose thence in a hierarchy of cities, regions, provinces, and nations parallel to the government system. Stalin nullified possible opposition by encouraging division and rivalry not only among the diverse hierarchies of power radiating downward from his own position in government, in party, army, police, and in economic life, but also within each hierarchy by encouraging the ambitious to seek to rise step by step through vacancies created by his periodic purges. These purges not only opened the way upward for younger and more ruthless men, but served as justifications for Stalin's growing paranoia. Within the party, the purges of 1924-29 to 29 had eliminated, usually by death, most of the old Bolsheviks, those who had been party members before the 1917 revolution. In 1929-34, through 34, using a new and younger group, Stalin had killed 10 million Russians, his own estimate, in the drive to establish collective farms. The second great purge in 1939-34-39 to, uh, 34 to 39, had killed off a large part of the Stalinists, who had assisted Stalin's rise to power and about 5,000 officers of the armed forces. The third great purge, which was shaping up at the end of 1952, was intended to eliminate the rest of the Stalinists who had come to positions of power in succession to the old Bolsheviks in 1929 to 35. They were already a dwindling group from Stalin's insatiable thirst for blood, as can be seen by ex examining the fate of the members of the 17th Party Congress of 1934. The Congress, which first raised Khrushchev and Lavrenti Beria to the Central Committee. Of the 1966 delegates to the 17th Congress, 1,108 were arrested for anti revolutionary crimes in, in sequel to the assassination of S.M. Kirov, party leader in Leningrad, which Stalin himself had arranged in December 1934. Of the 139 members and alternates elected to the Central Committee by that Congress of 1934, 98 or 70% were arrested and shot. Among the survivors were Kaganovich, Vyacheslav, Molotov, Georgi Malenkov, Beria, Anastas Mikoyan, K. Voroshilov, and Khrushchev. The new purge in 1953 was apparently aimed at some or most of these survivors. This terror was made worse by the fact that it did not or originate only from Stalin, although it undoubtedly required his acquiescence to proceed very far. Such acquiescence could often be obtained by his top subordinates, for the autocrat, autocrat undoubtedly appreciated those who were prepared, prepared to demonstrate their complete ruthlessness in his service. At the end of the war, Khrushchev, although not 
yet near the top of the pile, had shown more bloodthirsty ruthlessness combined with more groveling ob obsequiousness to Stalin than anyone else in Russia. At the war's end, the top trio in the gang were Stalin, Malenkov, and Andrei Zdanov. The, the last pair hated each other. Malenkov, in 1945-46, was the most active figure in the government, especially as chairman of the Committee for the Rehabilitation of Liberated Areas, and chairman of the committee in charge of dismantling German industry for reparations. Large-scale bungling in the administration of reparations gave Zdanov the opportunity he wished. Through Mikoyan, he instigated an attack on Malenkov's handling of reparations and recommended that dismantling be replaced by the settling up of Soviet-owned corporations to take over German industry in, Ger in Germany uh, to make goods for the Soviet Union. As a consequence of this failure, <clears throat> Malenkov, with his own associates, was demoted from several of his posts for about a year, June 1947 to June 1948. Immediately after his rehabilitation, Zdanov died mysteriously, and his chief supporters were arrested and shot, the so-called Leningrad case. In the meantime, Khrushchev was deeply involved in the effort to restore the collective farms, which had suffered great attrition during the war, and the more difficult task of bringing them under party control. In view of the ruthless way in which the collective farms had been established in 1928-34, to it was not surprising that neither the farms nor the party were popular with the peasants. Both were quietly sabotaged in ways which could neither be observed nor prevented, especially as party members and the secret police were both rare in rural districts. Evidence for such sabotage could be seen in the constant failure of the agricultural section of the economy to fulfill quotas or expectations, in the fact that the peasants produced four times as much in yield per unit areas on their small personal lot, plots of ground as they did on the wide acreage of the collective farms, and in the fact that farm animals in 1953 were well below the figures in 1928, while cows were 13% fewer than in 1916. <coughs> Despite a population increase of 25% from 1928 to 53, moreover, in the confusion of the war, at least 15 million acres of land belonging to the collective farms had been diverted to peasants' private lots, while millions of peasants on the collective farms were living in inefficient semi-idleness. Early in 1950, Khrushchev returned from 12 years of party butchery in the Ukraine and took over the agricultural problem. His solution, totally unworkable, was to move more vigorously in the Stalinist direction of increased centralization. He wished to merge the collective farms into increasingly large units and to work the peasants in increasingly large work br brigades in order to bring them in under control of the few communist party members to be found in the countryside. A party cell required three members as a minimum. And in 1950, a substantial fraction of the existing collective farms had no party cells at all, while the majority had cells of less than six members each. <coughs> in two years, by merging collective farms, Khrushchev reduced the total number of such units from 252,000 to 94,800, 94, but 18,000 still had no party cells, while only 5,000 had cells with over 25 members. Khrushchev wanted to carry the process of concentration even further by destroying the existing villages and centralizing the peasants in large urban settlements, so-called agro-towns. In such towns, they would be remote from their small private plots, would not spend so much time on them, and would be escorted in large gangs out to work each day on collective fields. This fantastic scheme was blocked by Berea and Molotov in 1951. Another scheme, which may have been associated with Khrushchev, was vetoed by Stalin in 1952. This would have distributed the person, personnel and machinery of the r Rural Machine Tractor Stations, MTS, among the collective farms, thus at one strike increasing the local availability 
the locally available party members, sorry, the locally av uh, available party members from their personnel to build up rural party cells and making available at short no notice necessary farm machinery. This suggestion was blocked by Stalin as a step backward from socialism. In its place, he suggested that the peasants' incentive to work on a on his private plot to produce for sale in the private market uh, be destroyed at one blow by forbidding the peasant access to any market or even to money by forcing him to dispose of all his surplus produce on a barter basis to the state. On the whole, Khrushchev's achievements as agricultural leader were far from successful, but this did not injure his reputation with Stalin, who recognized his personal devotion and energy and saw that his efforts were directed toward increasing party control in the countryside rather than the desirable but clearly less important goal of increased production. As a, a mark of this favor, at the 19th Party Congress in October 1952, Khrushchev uh, presented the report on the new party roles and saw one of his supporters, A.B. Aristov, take over charge of all personal appointments, appointments in the wide-spaced party network. Both of these developments were at the expense of Malenkov, the nominal head for party matters, but the latter was more than compensated by the privilege of taking Stalin's place as the chief party speaker in an eight-hour speech at the Congress. As this Congress of October 1952 assembled and dispersed, Stalin was already laying the groundwork for his third great purge of the party. No one, except perhaps Berea, could guess who was a target for elim elimination, <clears throat> but the rumors and hints from Stalin's personal secretariat made it appear that every one of the old guard of Stalinists should fear the worst. From October 1952 onward, these chief associates of Stalin lived in mounting terror. Like gangsters of the Capone era, they did not dare go to their homes at night, venture, ventured nowhere without personal bodyguards, and carried weapons on their persons. Berea remained dominant until November 1952 because Moscow was garrisoned by secret police divisions. The Kremlin guard was entirely in his control and no one else was allowed to bring weapons into the enclave. <laughs> Stalin moved with his customary skill, steadily dispersing and diluting the authority of the old guard. The number of ministries was increased. The Politburo ceased to meet. Its ten members were dissolved into a large presidium of 36, and the old guard was shifted from operating ministries to posts without portfolios. Molotov from foreign affairs, Kiganovich from heavy industry, Nikolai Blaganin from defense, Mikoyan from trade. The last of these shifts in November 1952 was the replaced, replacement of Berea as Minister of State at Security by S.D. Ignatiev. By that time, Poskribyshev and his assistant, Mikhail Ryoman, were already preparing the frame-up of Berea. This was the so-called doctor's plot, a fabrication which pretended that Zdanov and other leaders had been poisoned by a group of Kremlin doctors, mostly Jewish, who were, with Berea's knowledge, about to carry out a similar elimination of other leaders, including his high military officers. Under torture to severe... Tor under torture to severe that two of the nine doctors died, uh, the, the rest gave confessions. At this point, uh, just when the purge was to begin, Stalin died, possibly from a series of strokes, on March 5, 1953. Within six hours, the physician in charge of Stalin's last few days, Stalin's son, Vasily, who commanded the Air Force of the Moscow Military District, Poskra Byshev and the commanders of the Kremlin, the city, and the local military district all disappeared. Berea was called from a semi-exile to lead the merged ministries of interior and state security, and the administrative changes since uh, October 1952 were undone. The large presidium was replaced by the previous smaller Politburo of 10 men. The number of ministers was reduced from 55 to 25 and the inner cabinet was cut from 14 to 5. Most significantly, the old guard, which Stalin had been slowly moving away from the levers of power, were, at his death, quickly moved back to the center. Malenkov was made secretary of the party and premier of the government with five deputy premiers, Berea, Molotov, Bulganin, Kaganovich, and Mikoyan. Each of these was restored to his previous ministry, while Voroshilov became chairman of the presidium of the Supreme Soviet. <clears throat> 
Marshal Zukov was recalled from the rural exile to be first deputy to Bolganin in the defense ministry, and Khrushchev, with no major post, was made chairman of Stalin's funeral obsequies. Under his care, the deceased autocrat's body was placed, with the reverence becoming a demigod, alongside that of Lenin in the shrine overlooking Red Square. Then, a premier's a premier Malenkov's request, Khrushchev took over one of his two posts, that of secretary of the party. It was a fateful change. During Stalin's rule, the autocrat had held both chief positions in the state and in the party. Now, a week after the despot's death, the universal distaste for any revival of his power compelled Malenkov to yield up one of the positions to Khrushchev. We do not know why he decided to keep the premiership and give up the secretaryship of the party. Indeed, we do not know if he had any choice, but it may have seemed from the evidence of Stalin's later years that the premiership was a more significant post than the secretaries. It was not. Certainly it was not in the hands of the tacticians such as Khrushchev. During the next five years in the struggle for power, uh, whose details are still concealed, Khrushchev rose from the secretary's post to be supreme autocrat eliminating in the process all other possible claimants to power. The process by which this succeeded Stalin was almost a repetition of that by which Stalin had succeeded Lenin. In each case, the ultimately successful contender was the least prominent of, the, of a group of contenders. In each case, this victor used the post of secretary of the party as the chief weapon in his upward rise. In each case, this rise was achieved by a series of chess moves in which the most powerful rival contenders were eliminated one by one in a series of shifts, beginning from the most dangerous, in one case Trotsky, in the later case Berea. And in both, this whole process was done under a pretense of collective leadership. Immediately after Stalin's death, the collective leadership was headed by a triumvirate of Malenkov, Berea, and Molotov. Malenkov supported a policy of relaxation with increased emphasis on produ production of consumers' goods and rising standards of living, as well as increased efforts to avoid any international crisis which might lead to war. Berea supported a thaw in, in international matters, with large-scale amnesties for political prisoners, as well as a rehabilitation of those already liquidated at home and in the satellite states. Molotov continued to insist on the hard policies associated with Stalin, Full emphasis on heavy, heavy industry, no relaxation of the domestic tyranny, and continued pressure in the Cold War with the West. Wild rumors, especially among the satellites, and some relaxation at Ber Berea's behest in East Germany gave rise to false hopes among the workers there. On June, on June 16th, 16th, 1953, these workers rose up against the communist government in East Berlin. After a day of hesitation, these uprisings were crushed with the full power of the Soviet occupation armored divisions. Using this event as an excuse, the leaders in the Kremlin suddenly arrested Berea and shot him with six of his aides, either immediately or in December, depending on the version of these events. The overthrow of the Master of Terror was supported by the regular army, whose chief leaders were pre present in the next room armed with smuggled machine guns when the showdown between Berea and his colleagues occurred in the Gremlin conference room. Berea apparently suspected nothing and set down his briefcase in which he had a pistol hidden. During the conference, while one leader distracted his attention, another removed the pistol from the briefcase. Berea was then told he was under arrest. He dived for his briefcase, found his pistol gone, and looked up into the muzzle of his own gun. He was already removed four divisions he had he had already moved four divisions of, of of their forces into moscow to replace the usual secret police forces guarding the city this use of the armies to settle the personal struggle in the kremlin is the chief factor which was different in khrushchev's rise to power from the early earlier rise to power of stalin in 1924 to 29 there could be little doubt that the introduction of this new factor was due to khrushchev and that his secret Speech denouncing Stalin in February 1956 was part of his p payoff to the armed forces for their role in the process. The overthrow of Berea was followed by an extensive curtailment of the secret police and its powers. Most of the latter went to the Interior Ministry, while its forces were subjected to separate control and its system of secret courts was abolished. 
Many of its prisoners were released, and there was considerable relaxation of the censorship, especially in literature. Some of the powers of the police were taken over by the party. In February 1954, a large conference of agricultural leaders in Moscow was thunderstruck by a suggestion from Khrushchev for a radical new approach to the chronic agricultural shortages. This virgin lands scheme advocated opening for cultivation in Asia large areas of grassland which had never been cultivated before. Khrushchev's plan was detailed and dazzlingly attractive. It entailed use of over 100,000 tractors and great hordes of manpower to cultivate grain on 6 million new acres in 1954 and an additional 25 million acres in 1955. The scheme, carried out in an atmosphere of heated discussion, was not supervised by Khrushchev. Its requirements in machinery and equipment were so great that it represented a sharp restriction on Malenkov's shift of emphasis from heavy industry to consumer goods, while Khrushchev's refusal to supervise it placed the responsibility for its success at Malenkov's door. At the same time, Malenkov's public advocacy of a thaw in Soviet-American relations was equally weakened by the secret Soviet drive to perfect the H-bomb. <laughs> While the undermining of Malenkov was thus in process in 1954, Khrushchev began to undermine Molotov in the foreign field by organizing a series of spectacular foreign visits without the foreign secretary. One of the first of these, in September 1954, took Bulganin, Khrushchev, Mikoyan, and others to Peking to celebrate the fifth birthday of the Red China. During the visit, Khrushchev apparently made a personal alliance with Mao Zedong, as well as a complicated commercial treaty which offered Soviet finance, equipment, and specialized skills for an all-out industrialization of China, the so-called Great Leap Forward. <laughs> These events made it possible for Khrushchev to organize a campaign against Malenkov during the winter of 1954-55. Ostensibly, this was based on Malenkov's desire to relax the intense emphasis on heavy industrialization, but in fact, Malenkov's lack of aggressiveness in foreign policy was equally significant. In combination, the two issues created pressure which Malenkov could not resist. On February 8, 1955, his resignation was read to the Supreme Soviet. He assumed responsibility for the unsatisfactory state of Soviet agriculture and relinquished the post of Premier, although remaining on the Central Committee in the new post of Minister of Power Stations. The new Premier was Bolganin, who re released his previous post of Defense Minister to his deputy, Marshal Zhukov, hero of the World War II. These struggles within the Kremlin are based on persons, not on issues, since the latter are used chiefly as weapons in the struggle. In the shift from Malenkov to Bolganin, the critical issues were the chronic agricultural problems and the choice between Stalin's policy of relentless industrialization, regardless of the cost to peasants and workers, and the new policy of increased consumers' goods. In this last issue, the needs of defense from brought, brought Khrushchev support from Marshal Zhukov, the armed forces, and the Stalinists such as Molokov and Kaganovich. Zhukov was rewarded with a ministry, ministry and a seat in the Presidium, the only army officer ever to have the latter. <coughs> the gradual elimination of Molotov found Khrushchev on the opposite side of Stalinist versus anti-Stalinist debate as champion of a thaw in the Cold War. This involved a rejection of Stalin's doctrine of an inevitable enmity of non-satellite countries and the inevitable onset of imperialist war from capitalist aggression. In this struggle, Khrushchev found support in Bulganin, Mikoyan, and probably Zhukov. The new policy was established while Malikov was still foreign minister through a series of elaborate state visits by Bulganin and Khrushchev, B and K as they were called, to foreign countries. The most significant of these, because it marked a sharp reversal both of Stalin and of Molotov, was a six-day visit to Tito in Yugoslavia in May 1955. This acceptance of Titoism is one of great importance because it showed Russia in an apologetic role for a ma major past error and because it reversed Stalin's rule that all communist parties everywhere must follow the Kremlin's leadership. The Belgrade de Declaration admitted that different countries could walk different roads to socialism, and that such differences in the concrete application of socialism are the exclusive concern of individual countries. Khrushchev and Tito both knew that this statement was playing with fire. The former's motives are obscure. It was probably done simply as a challenge to Molotov's whole past record. 
Tito unquestionably hoped the dynamite would explode sufficiently to blow the East European satellites out of the Soviet control. With his customary shrewdness, Khrushchev did not sign the Belgrade Declaration himself, but had Bulganin, the new premier, do it, thus protecting himself from direct responsibility if anything went wrong. This declaration was not the only stick of dynamite which Khrushchev was juggling as he returned from Yugoslavia. En route, he stopped off in Bucharest and Sofia. In the latter capital, he placed the fuse in another, even larger stick of dynamite by a secret denunciation of Stalin personally as a bloodthirsty tyrant. Back in Moscow in early July, Molotov made an uncompromising attack on the Belgrade Declaration, denouncing it as encouragement to the satellites to pursue ind independent policies, a consequence wh which all agreed would be totally unacceptable to anyone in the Kremlin. But Khrushchev won over the majority by arguing that the loyalty of the satellites, and especially their vital economic co cooperation, could be ensued, in, ensured better by a loose leash than by a club. He scorned Molotov's opposition to an agreement with Tito by contrasting it with Molotov's agreement of August 1939 with Ribbentrop. The solidity of the satellite was to be pre preserved by the Warsaw Pact of May 14, 1955, which established a 20-year alliance of the Soviet Union, Albania, Bulgaria, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Poland, Romania, and East Germany. This was the communist riposte to NATO, which the newly sovereign West German state had joined as a 15th member five days earlier, May 9, 1955. Straight from his arguments with Molotov in the Central Committee, Khrushchev dashed off with Bulganin, Molotov, and Zukov to the 1955 summit meeting in Geneva. There he kept quietly in the background while his companions discussed the fate of Germany with President Eisenhower, Dulles, Eden, and Premier far of France. The 1955 summit conference at Geneva of, on July 18th through 24th was Anthony Eden's contribution to the thaw. Dulles participated most reluctantly, but there has been an increasingly unfavorable comment on his inflexible attitude toward the Russians, and he felt compelled to yield to Eden's insistence in order to help Eden's conservative, conservative party in the British general elections of May 1955. Once these were successfully passed, the meeting had to be carry out, carried out, but Dulles had no hopes of its success. He contributed little in this direction himself when he insisted that disarmament must be discussed before German reun reunion. Outsiders, trying to interpret the Russian attitude toward the fall on the basis of no reliable information, placed much great hopes in the summit meeting th than Dulles did chiefly because of the surprising Soviet shift which had pr produced the Austrian Peace Treaty of May 15, 1955, with its subsequent ev evacuation of Austria by Russian troops. The Austrian Treaty restored the country's frontiers of January 1938 and promised free navigation of the Danube, while pr prohibiting any union with Germany and binding Austria to neutrality. The neutralization of Austria gave rise in 1955 to a good deal of vague talk about disengagement in Europe. The idea, however, defined, had considerable attraction in Europe, even for experienced diplomats like Eden. Nothing very definite could be agreed upon as making up disengagement, but everyone was eager for anything which would reduce the threat of war, and the Germans especially had long, longing thoughts of a neutralized and united country. France, which was deeply involved at the time in Indochina and in Muslim countries, particularly Algeria, was eager for any relaxation in Europe which would allow the breathing spell to devote to its colonial problems. To help the discussion along, the Russians spoke favorably about disarmament, Europe for the Europeans, and German reunion. When details of these suggestions appeared, however, they usually justified completely Dulles's skepticism. Disarmament for example, meant to the Russians total renunciation of nuclear weapons and drastic cuts in ground forces, a combination which would make the United States very weak against Russia while leaving Russia still dominant in Europe. Sometimes this result was sought more directly. Withdrawal of both the U.S. and the Soviet Union from Europe, and the former to North America, thousands of miles away, and the latter merely to the Russian frontiers. Another Russian suggestion was to replace NATO with a European security pact, which would include only European states. The Soviet suggestions for Germany were equally tricky and 
show clearly their fear to subject their East German satellite to a popular election and their real reluctance to see Germany united. They demanded unification first and elections later, while the United States reversed the order. The merging of the two existing German governments, followed by a peace treaty along the lines of the Austrian treaty, would have given the Russian, Russians what they wanted in Europe and Germany freed from Western troops ruled by a coalition government which would allow elections when it judged best. The Americans wanted elections first to establish an acceptable central German government with which a final peace could be made. The creation of two sovereign German states in 1954 made it any settlement remote because the Kremlin insisted that its East German satellite regime, which was not recognized by the U.S., must be a, part, a party to any settlement and thus be recognized by the U.S. This same point became a permanent obstacle also to any agreement to unify Berlin, since the U.S. was willing to negotiate with Russia but not, to the, not with East Germany. <clears throat> Eden own, Eden's own contribution contribution to these discussions was that a demilitarized zone by established along the line of physical contact between East and West in Europe with international inspection of armed forces in Germany. Suddenly, on the fourth day of the conference, President Eisenhower made a, a speech which jolted the delegates, and even more the world, out of their usual attention. This was his open skies plan, which never came to anything but which gave the U.S. a propaganda advantage uh, the Soviet Union could not overcome. It had two parts, the two uh, superpowers to give each other uh, a complete blueprint of our military establishments from beginning to end, from one end of our countries to the other. And next, next to provide within our country's facilities for aerial photography to the other country. And nothing could be more repugnant to the in ingrained Soviet love of secrecy except for full inspection of, of the country on the ground, but nothing could be... Uh, more clearly show the world that the U.S. was a frank and honest as its president's own face. Neither had anything to hide. <clears throat> Nothing significant was achieved at the Geneva Conference, but, but the discussions were conducted in an, an unprecedented atmosphere of friendly cooperation, which came to be known as the Geneva Spirit, and continued for several years. In fact, it was never completely overcome, even when matters were at their worst in the weeks following the U-2 incident of May 1960 and the Cuban crisis of October 1962. This was because the Soviet Union, having emerged from the isolation imposed on it by Stalin's mania, never returned to it completely, but continued to cooperate with non-communist countries in scientific interchange, athletic events, and social intercourse. From 1955 onward, speakers of Russia... Russian and of English were in cooperation somewhere on some project. <clears throat> the most amazing of these projects was the International Geo Geophysical Year of 1957 through 58, in which scientists of 66 countries cooperated over 18 months to wring from the physical universe of Earth, Sea, and Sun some of its secrets. Returned to Moscow from Geneva, Khrushchev abandoned his unwanted quiet and resumed his stalking of Molotov. In September 1955, the harassed foreign minister had to make a public confession of error, admitting that he did not know what point the Soviet Union had reached in its progress along the road to socialism. In February, he had told the Supreme Soviet that the foundations of social, socialist society had been built. It now appeared that the society itself was built. Such a mistake, regarded as Pekin in the outside world, could inflict almost irreparable damage on a Soviet leader if publicly, publicly confessed, as this was. It was a clear indication to other such leaders that Molotov was on the way out. During all this, Khrushchev had held no office in the Soviet government and had functioned only as party leader, but what he did in that capacity was of vital significance. Systematically, he replaced party functionaries on all levels, moving upward those he could depend on and eliminating those he could not trust to support him personally. The other rival leaders in the government knew what was going on, but ignored it, since they made the one basic error which could not be remedied. They believed that the government was the ruling structure of the Soviet Union, while Khrushchev, quietly at his work within the party structure, looked forward to the day on which he, could, he would demonstrate their error. In February 1956, in what is unquestionably one of the most significant events in the history of communism, Khrushchev lighted one of his sticks of dynamite. The subsequent explosion is still echoing, and the resulting wound to international communism still bleeds freely. Khrushchev pr 
preparation for a party congress was as careful as Stalin's had ever been. It was to be sounding board for coordinating party policy by his speeches and his hand-picked subordinates. In July 1955, the Congress was called for February 14, 1956. At the same time, the two Khrushchev agents were added to the Presidium, Mikhail Sislov and Igor Kirichenko, and three Khrushchev agents were added to the party secretariat, Averki Aristov, Ivan Belyev, and Dmitry Shepilov. The last, who, were, who was editor of the Pravda, the party newspaper, gave the speech on foreign policy at the Congress. Although Molotov was still foreign minister and was not replaced by Shepilov until August, Aristov soon took over the role Pos uh, Poskrabyshev had previously played for Stalin in charge of loyalty purges within the party. Uh, the, 20, the 20th Party Congress met for 11 days, February 14th through 25th, 1956, within the Kremlin walls. Its uh, 1,436 hand-picked delegates formed the oldest Congress which had ever assembled, with 24% of 50 years of age, compared to 15.3% over 50 at the 19th Congress, and only 1.8% over 50 at the 18th Congress of February 1941. These men were fully prepared to support whatever was told them, but, not, but none could have anticipated the shocking revelations they would hear. It all began in a, a rather routine fashion. The first speech of 50,000 words, delivered by Khrushchev over seven hours, one hour less than Malik Balenkov's parallel speech in October 1952, was full of factual details. It was notable only for its frequent reference to the urgent need for coexistence with the West and its infrequent use of the name Stalin. The emphasis on coexistence was part of the campaign against Molotov and, as is usual in communist speeches, was filled with references by volume and page to the writings of Lenin. Most of these references proved, on examination, to be embedded in a context expounding the inevitable clash between communism and capitalism. The delegates, fully trained in such dialect, had no difficulty in seeing the point. Coexistence was merely a temporary tactic in the larger framework of inevitable struggle. Similar references were made to the possibility of peaceful rather than revolutionary change from capital to socialism in single countries. In this case, examples were given. The Baltic states, the European satellites, and China. The reference to Lenin, volume um, 33, pages 57 through 58, made it perfectly clear that the peaceful road to socialism could be followed only where a small capitalist state was overrun by a powerful communist neighbor. The chief surprise of the general sessions of the party congress was the speech from that old party chameleon, Anastas Mikoyan. It openly criticized Stalin for his disregard of party po dem democracy and his cult of personality, which insisted on personal ad adulation and on the constant rewriting of party records in Russian history so that Stalin would always appear as the infallible and clairvoyant leader. The real expo explosion came at a secret all-night session on July 24th through 25th, from which all foreign delegates were excluded. Those who listened were warned to take no notes or records. In a speech of 30,000 words, Khrushchev made a horrifying attack on Stalin as a bloodthirsty and demented tyrant who had destroyed tens of thousands of loyal party members on falsified ev evidence, or no evidence at all, merely to satisfy his own insatiable thirst for power. All the changes... All, I mean, all the charges which had been uh, made by anti-communists and anti-Stalinists in the 1930s were repeated and driven home with special details, dates, and names. The full nightmare of the Soviet system re was revealed not as an attribute of the system, which it was, but as a personal idiosyncrasy of Stalin himself. Not as the chief feature of communism from 1917, which it was, but only as its chief feature since 1934 and nothing was said of the full collaboration in the process of terror provided to Stalin by the surviving members of the Politburo led by Khrushchev himself. But all the rest, which the fellow travelers throughout the world had been denying for a generation, poured out. The enormous slave labor camps, the murder of innocent persons by tens of thousands, the wholesale violation of law, the use of fiendishly planned torture to exact confessions for acts never done or to involved persons who were completely innocent. Uh, the ruthless elimination of whole classes and whole nations, such as the army officers, the Kulaks, the Kalmak, Chechen, Ingush, and Balkar minority groups, 
their, the servility of writers, artists, and everyone else, including all its party members, to the tyrant was revealed, along with a total failure of his agricultural schemes, his cowardice and incompetence in the war, his insignificance in the early history of the party, and his constant rewriting of history to conceal these things. A few passages from this speech will indicate its tone. Stalin's negative characteristics, which in Lenin's time were only beginning, changed in his last years in a grave abuse of power which caused untold harm to the party. Stalin acted not through persuasion, explanation, and patient cooperation with people, but by imposing his ideas and by demanding complete submission to his opinion. Whoever opposed this or tried to argue his own point of view was doomed to be purged, purged in subsequent moral and physical annihilation. Stalin originated the concept enemy of the people, in term, a term which made it unnecessary to prove the ideological errors of the victim. It made it possible to use the cruelest repression and utmost illegality against anyone who disagreed in any way with Stalin, against those who were only suspected or had been subjects of rumors. This concept, enemy of the people, eliminated any possibility of ideological fight or of rebuttal. Usually the only evidence used against all the rules of modern legal science was the confession of the accused, and as subsequent investigation showed, such confessions were obtained by physical pressure on the accused. The formula enemy of the people was specifically introduced for the purpose of physically annihilating these persons. He abandoned the method of ideological struggle for administrative violence, mass repressions, and terror. Lenin used such methods only against actual class enemies and not against those who blunder or err and whom it is possible to lead through theory and even re retain as leaders. Stalin so elevated himself above the party and above the state that he ceased to consider either the Central Committee or the party. The number of arrests based on charges of counter-revolutionary crimes increased tenfold from 1936 to 37. When the cases of some of these so-called spies and saboteurs were examined, it was found that all their cases were fabricated. Confessions of guilt of many were gained by cruel and inhuman tortures. Comrade uh, Rudzitak, can candidate member of the Politburo, party member from 1905, who spent 10 years in Tsarist hard labor camp, completely retracted in court the confession which had been forced from him. This retraction was ignored in spite of the fact that Rudzitak had been chief of the party Central Control Commission established by Lenin to ensure party unity. He was not even called before the Central Committee's Politburo because Stalin refused to talk to him. The sentence was pronounced in a trial of 20 minutes and he was shot. After careful re-examination of the case in 1955, it was established that the accusation against Rudzitak was false and based on falsified evidence. The way in which the NKVD manufactured fictitious anti-Soviet centers and blocks can be seen in the case of Comrade Rosenblum, party member from 1906, who was arrested in 1937 by the Leningrad NKVD. He was subjected to terrible torture, during which he was ordered to confess false information about himself and other persons. He was then brought to the office of Zhukovsky, who offered him freedom on condition that he make before the court a false confession fabricated in 1937 by the NKVD concerning sabotage, espionage, and subversion in a terroristic center in Leningrad. With unbelievable cynicism, Zhukovsky told about the method for the creation of fabricated anti-Soviet pl plots. You yourself, said Z Zhukovsky, will not need to invent anything. The NKVD will prepare for you an outline for every branch of the center. You will have to study it carefully and to remember well all the questions and answers which the court may ask. Your future will depend on how the trial goes and on its results. If you manage to endure, you will save your head, and we will feed it, and, and we will feed and clothe you at the government's expenses until your death. The NKVD prepared lists of persons who were whose case, uh, cases were before the military tribunal and whose sentences were prepared in advance. Yetzov would send these lists to Stalin personally for his approval of the punishments. In 1937-38, through 38, such lists of many thousands of party, government, communist, youth, army, and economic workers were sent to Stalin. He approved those lists. Stalin was a very distrustful man, morbidly suspicious. He knew this from, we knew this from, from our work with him. He would look at a man and say, why are your eyes so shifty today? Or, why are you turning so much today and why do you avoid looking at me directly? The sickly suspicion created in him distrust of em eminent 
party workers he had known for years. Everywhere in, every, in everything he saw enemies, two-facers, and spies. How is it possible that a person confesses to a crime which he has not committed? Only in one way, by application of physical pressure, tortures, bringing him to a, a state of unconsciousness, depra, uh, deprivation of his judgment, uh, taking away his human dignity. In this way he were confessions obtained. Only a few days before the present Congress we called to the Central Committee Presidium and interrogate, uh, interrogated uh, the invest, investigative judge Rodos, who in his time investigated the in, interrogated Kossior, Chubar, and Kossaryev. He is a vile person with the brain of a bird, a morally complete degener degenerate, and it was this man who was deciding the fate of the prominent party workers. He told us, I was told that Kossior and Chubar were people's enemies, and for that reason I, as investigative judge, had to make them confess that they are enemies. I thought that I, ex I was executing the orders of the party. <clears throat> The secret speech also destroyed Stalin's reputation as a military genius, as follows. Uh, during the war and afterwards, Stalin said that the tragedy experienced by the nation in the early days of the war resulted from the unexpected attack by the Germans. But comrades, this is completely untrue. By April 3, 1941, Churchill, through his ambassador to the USSR, Cripps, personally warned Stalin that the Germans were regrouping their armed units to attack the Soviet Union. Churchill stressed this repeatedly in his dispatches of April 18th and in the following days. Stalin took no heed of these warnings. Moreover, he warned that no credence be given to information of this sort in order not to provoke the beginning of military operations. Information of this kind on German invasion of Soviet territory was coming in from our own military and diplomatic sources. Despite these particularly grave warnings, the necessary steps were not taken to prepare the country properly for defense and to prevent it from being caught unawares. Did we have time and resources for such preparation? Yes, we did. Our industry was fully capable of supplying everything the Soviet army needed. Had our industry been mobilized properly and in, this, in time to supply the army, our wartime losses would have been decidedly smaller. On the eve of the invasion, a German citizen crossed our border and stated that the German armies had orders to start their offensive on the night of June 22nd at 3 a.m. Stalin was informed of this immediately, but even this was ignored. As you see, everything was ignored. The result was that in the first hours and days of the enemy, Destroyed in our border, regions of large part of our air force, artillery, and other equipment. He annihilated large numbers of our soldiers and disorganized our military leadership. Conse consequently, we could not prevent the enemy from marching deep into the country. Very grievous consequences, especially at the beginning of the war, followed Stalin's destruction of many military commanders and political workers during 1937-41. through 41. Because of his suspiciousness and false accusations, during that time the leaders who had gained military experience in Spain and the Far East were almost completely liquidated. After the first severe disaster and defeats at the front, Stalin thought that this was the end. He said, All that which Lenin created we have lost forever. After this, Stalin for a long time actually did not direct the military operations and ceased to do anything whatever. Therefore, the danger which hung over our fatherland in the first period of the war was largely due to the faulty methods of directing the nation and the party by Stalin himself. Later, the nervousness and hysteria which Stalin showed, interfering with actual military operations, caused our army serious damage. He was a very far from any understanding of real situation which was developing on the front. This was natural, for in the whole war he never visited any section of the front or any liberated city. When a very serious situation developed for our army in the Kharkov region in 1942, he decided to give up on an operation seeking to encircle Kharkov to avoid fatal consequences if the operation continued. Contrary to sense, Stalin rejected our suggestion and issued orders to continue the operation. I telephoned to Stalin at his villa, but he refused to answer the phone, and Malenkov was on the receiver. I stated for a second time that I wanted to speak to Stalin personally about the grave situation at the front, but Stalin did not consider it convenient to raise the phone and insisted that I must speak to him through Malenkov, although he was only a few steps away. After listening in this fashion to our plea, Stalin said, Let everything remain as it is. What was the result of this? The worst that we had expected. The Germans surrounded our army concentrations and we lost hundreds of thousands of our soldiers. This is Stalin's military genius and what it, 
it cost us. After this party, Congress, we shall have to reevaluate our military operations and present them in their true light. After our great victory, which cost us so much, Stalin began to belittle many of the commanders who contributed to the victory because Stalin excluded every possibility that victories at the front should be credited to anyone but himself. He began to tell all kinds of nonsense about Zhukov. He popularized himself as a great leader and tried to inculcate in the people the idea that all victories won in the war were due to the courage, daring, and genius of Stalin and no one else. Let us take, for instance, our historical and military firm, films and some written works. They make us feel sick. Their real purpose is the propagation of the theme of Stalin as a military genius. Remember the film The Fall of Berlin? Here only Stalin acts. He issues orders in a hall in which there are many empty chairs, and only one man approaches him and reports to him. That is, uh, Poskrabyshev, his loyal shield-bearer. Where is the military command? Where is the Politburo? Where is the government? And what are they doing? There is nothing about them in the film. Stalin acts for everybody. He pays no attention to them. He asks no one for advice. Where are the military who bear the burden of the war? They are not in the film. With Stalin in it, there is no room for them. You see, to what Stalin's delusions of grandeur led, he had completely lost consciousness of our reality. One characteristic example of Stalin's self-glorification and of his lack of elementary modesty was his short biography published in 1948. It is an expression of most dissolute flattery, making a man into a god, transforming him into an infallible sage, the greatest leader and most sublime strategist of all times and nations. No other words could be found to raise Stalin to the heavens. We need not give examples of the loathsome adult adulation filling this book. They were all approved and edited by Stalin personally, and some of them were added in his own handwriting to the draft of the book. He added, Although he performed his task of leader of the party and the people with consummate skill and enjoyed, enjoyed their unreserved support of the whole Soviet people, Stalin never allowed his work to be marred by the slightest hint of va uh, vanity, conceit, or self-adulation. I'll cite one more insertion made by Stalin. I'll cite one more insertion made by Stalin. <clears throat> the advanced Soviet science of war received further development at Comrade Stalin's hands. He elaborated the theory of the permanently operating factors that decided the issue of wars. Comrade Stalin's genius enabled him to divide the enemy's plans and defeat them. The battles in which Comrade Stalin directed the Soviet armies are brilliant examples of the operational military skill. All those who interested themselves even a little in the national situation saw the difficult situation in ag agriculture, but Stalin never even noticed it. Did we tell Stalin about this? Yes, we told him. But he did not support us. Why? Because Stalin never traveled anywhere, did not meet city or farm workers, he did not know the actual situation in the provinces. He knew the country and the agriculture only from films. And these films had dressed up and beautified the existing situation in agriculture. They so pictured collective farm life that the tables were bending from the weight of turkeys and geese. Stalin thought it was actually so. Stalin proposed that the taxes paid by the collective farms and their workers should be raised by 40 billion rubles. According to him, the peasants are well off and the collective farm worker would need to sell only one more chicken to pay his taxes full. Imagine what is what this meant. Certainly, 40 billion rubles is a sum greater than everything the collective farmers obtained for all the products they sold to the state. In 1952, for instance, the collective farms and their workers received 26,280 million rubles for all their products sold to the government. Their proposal is not based on the actual assessment of the situation, but on the fantastic ideas of a person divorced from reality. It was inconceivable inconceivable that this extraordinary speech could be kept a secret in spite of all their warnings at its delivery that it must be. That was the end of quote in the previous sentence before. Versions of it, some of them softened, were sent out by the Kremlin to foreign party leaders. One of these found its way to the United States government and was published in June 2, 1956. There is not the slightest doubt that the speech is authentic and that almost everything it says is true. But the, but the mystery remains. Why did the Kremlin leaders decide to speak thus of a situation which every student of the subject knew, at least partially, but which could still be denied so long as it was not admitted?
One factor in the making the speech was undoubtedly the, the determination of the army to clear itself of the unjust accusations made against its officers in 1937 through 41 and against the effort to attribute the disasters of 1941 through 42 to professional incompetence. Just as the German generals after 1945 wanted to blame their defeat on Hitler, so the Russian generals, with much greater justification, wanted to blame their early defeats on Stalin. But there undoubtedly must all have been other causes of which we are not yet aware. The anti-Stalin speech, like the admission of error in the alienation from Tito, inevitably had injurious influence on the communism throughout the world, especially in the satellite powers and ultimately became the ideological basis for the splitting of these powers into Stalinist and anti-Stalinist groupings led by Red China and the Soviet Union. Certain points about this speech are noteworthy. In the first place, all the criticism of Stalin is directed at his actions subsequent to 1934. These are criticized not because they were vile in themselves, but because they were injurious to the party and to the loyal party members. Throughout his speech, as in everything else he did in the, this period, Khrushchev was working to strengthen the party. Moreover, by directing his criticism at Stalin personally, he exculpated himself and the other Bolshevik survivors who were fully as guilty as Stalin was. Guilty not merely because they acquiesced in Stalin's atrocities from his fear, as Khrushchev admitted in, in this speech, but because they fully cooperated with him. A study of Khrushchev's own life shows that he supported Stalin's atrocities fully at the time, often anticipated them, benefited personally from them, and egged Stalin on to greater ones. In fact, even as Khrushchev in his speech condemned Stalin's acts, which caused the deaths of thousands in the party, he defended Stalin's acts, which caused the deaths of millions in the country. The fault was not merely with Stalin, it was with the system, and even wider than that, it was with Russia. Any system of human life, <laughs> human life which is based on autocracy and authority, as Russian life has always been, will turn up sadistic monsters, as Russia has th throughout its history, again and again. The more completely total and irresponsible power is concentrated in one man's hands, the more frequently will a, a monster of sadism be produced. The very structure of Russian life on the authoritarian lines it had always possessed drove Khrushchev, as it had driven Stalin 30 years before, to concentrate all power in his own hands. Neither man could re relax halfway to power for fear that someone else would continue on seeking the peak of power. The basis of the whole system was fear, and like all neurotic drives in the neurotic system, such fear could not be overcome even by the achievement of total power. That is why it grows into paranoia and is as did with Ivan the Terrible, Peter the Great, Paul I, Stalin, and others. <laughs> During all the struggle for power within the Kremlin, foreign affairs were still actively pursued by the Soviet leaders. The chief event was changed in direction from Europe to Asia, which took place in the spring of 1955. In the Austrian Treaty, the Reconciliation with Tito, the stalemate over the German problem, the Warsaw Pact, and the Geneva spirit were all parts of a plan to put Europe on ice in order to shift attention to Southeast Asia, to India, and to the, East, and to the Near East. This new direction was opened by beginning arms shipments to Colonel Gamal Nasser of Egypt in the spring of 1955 and reached its peak in the so-called Suez Crisis in October 1956. <laughs> A similar effort in India, seeking to win its support for the Soviet bloc, began with a state visit to India and Burma by Balgan and, and, and Khrushchev in November 1955. This new direction and its consequences will be described in a moment, but it must be recognized that the continued struggle for control within the Kremlin and the satellite states were in parallel with the growing crisis in the Near East and that both reached the critical stage at the same time in October 1956. The struggle between the Stalinists and anti-Stalinists within the satellite states and the discontent of the inhabitants with both groups kept public affairs agitated along the whole zone of satellite areas from the Baltic to the Balkans. Khrushchev's secret speech increased this agitation. Pressure on Khrushchev inside the Kremlin to reverse his professed policy of destalinization grew 
Khrushchev struck back on June 2, 1956, the same day that Tito arrived for a state visit to Moscow. Molotov was removed as foreign minister and replaced by Khrushchev's agent Shepilov, the editor of the Pravda. By the satellite, uh, but the satellite turmoil continued. This turmoil, which agitated, which agitated Eastern Europe for many years, may be regarded as a series of clashes between Stalinism and Titoism. Neither of these is an extreme pole of dualistic opposition, but rather to a position, two positions on a number of scales, concerned rather with methods than with goals. Both have a goal, have as a goal the creation of power in the prosperous communist systems, but they do not agree on methods or rather on the relative mixture of methods to be used to reach their goal. Each sees industrialization as, a ne as necessary to such a goal, but Tito is, perhaps necessarily, more willing to use foreign investment and foreign technical guidance if these are free from any political control. Stalinism in general dis distrusts all foreign help as spying. Relying on domestic capital accumulation and determined to raise it speedily, Stalinism puts severe pressures on the peasantry and thus emphasizes collective farms under political pressure, while Titoism, prepared to make much more use of private agriculture and of economic incentives for food production. This entails a slower rate of industrialization and more emphasis on improved standards of living. There are also other more per, um, pervasive differences. Stalinism insists on uniformity and centralized authority, while Titoism is more willing to allow diversity and collegial control. This, in their terms, is the distinction between mono monolithic bloc and collective leadership. When the monolithic bloc is subject to criticism, it is called the cult of personality. In the satellites, for historical reasons, there are other sharp distinctions between Stalinism and Titoism. The former favors Russian domin domination, while the latter favors local nationalism. As a consequence, in 1945 through 60, the former favored those local leaders who had spent the pre-war and war periods in exile in the Soviet Union, while the latter favored the underground fighters who had stayed at home in the left-wing resistance groups. And finally, the Stalinists upheld their road to socialism as the only road, while the Titoists contended that this contended there were many roads to socialism. As might be expected, political oppression in the role of the monolithic party was associated with one point of view, while the greater readiness to allow diversity of outlook in coalition re regimes marked the other. There is no doubt that Stalin intended to establish a fully Stalinist system as just described in Eastern Europe, the zone, as Sutton Watson called it. But this could not be done immediately in the chaos of the war's ending. Accordingly, a, a period of real coalition regimes was established based on the association of all groups and parties which had resisted Nazism. Most of these groups were made up of peasants, workers, and intellectuals led by a combination of exiles back from Russia and hardened resistance fighters. One of the chief acts of these coalition regimes in most countries was ag agrarian reform, that is, the, the division of former large estates into the hands of peasant owners. Within a few years, and in most cases by 1948, this coalition was broken down and replaced by narrow Stalinist control, governed by a typical Stalinist tyranny. This was achieved by getting the significant government posts into the hands of hardcore Stalinists, usually the former Moscow exiles, and forcing other groups out of the coalition. In this process, the presence of Soviet troops was often a vital factor. Along with this went a social, economic, and propagandist campaign to split the farmers by calling the more affluent, better educated, and more obstinate ones agrarian reactionaries and enemies of the people. These were liquidated frequently by death. The chief index showing that this stage had been reached was a, was usually a reversal of the agricultural policy from an agrarian reform to collectivization, similar to that achieved in Russia in 1930-34. As one consequence of this change, each satellite found its welfare, especially in economics, subordinated to that of the Soviet Union. This was reflected in numerous economic and commercial agreements which set up conditions of commercial exchange in joint-owned public corporations able to milk the satellite countries for Russia's benefit. Some of this was based on reparations. As examples of this exploitation, we might mention that the joint corporations in East Germany drained, that, uh, for, drained from that area a 
goods worth a, a billion Reichmarks a year in terms of 1936 prices in the 1946 through 48 period. The Soviet-Polish Coal Agreement of 1945 bound Poland to sell coal to Russia at one-tenth the price obtainable elsewhere. In all, it was it has been estimated that the Soviet Union extracted goods worth 20 billion out of the Eastern Europe in 1945 through 46. By 1952, Eastern Europe, with the notable exception of Yugoslavia, was being organized as a colony of Soviet Union along the Stalinist lines. The bitter attacks on Tito arose from Tito's refusal to accept this and from the challenge which the existence of his different systems offered to Stalin's control. Tito was able to resist because he was outside the zone of Soviet military occupation and had built up a military and bureaucratic hierarchy loyal to him. While inside that zone, these hierarchies had been constructed under Soviet guidance that were loyal to Stalin rather than to the local leaders. The one exception, Albania, sided with Stalin because it feared Yugoslavia, just as Tito feared the Soviet Union as a too powerful neighbor. In 1951-52, through 52, the incipient purge in the Soviet Union was extended to the satellites where its anti-Semitic overtones were even more evident. Rudolf Slansky, leader of the Czech Communist Party, was tried and executed in spite of his abject subservience to Stalin, while Anna Palker was removed from her offices in Romania. This drove Tito closer to the Western camp and led Tito's friend Milovan Gilas to recognize that the problem of Stalinism was not personal but institutional, caused by the structure of the system, a disease fatal to any real social welfare. He called this disease bureaucratic degeneration. When Gilas went further at the end of 1953 and recognized that the real issue was between freedom and absolutism, a choice for all the zone between the West and the East. He broke with Tito because his criticism clearly applied to Tito's authoritarian bureaucracy as well. Many persons in the satellites, even the young one, young who uh, had a lifelong indoctrination in the authoritarian outlook, reached similar conclusions and were like tinder to any anti-Soviet spark. The sparks were provided by Khrushchev with his continued curtailment of the secret police, his acceptance of Titoism, and above all, his secret speech. Few recognized that Khrushchev was basically an ultra-Stalinist himself, fully committed to foreign aggression, to ultra-industrialization, and to ruthless discipline of the working masses, especially the peasants. His tactical shifts were taken as indicators of moderate personality, while in fact Khrushchev was as extreme as Stalin and more reckless. As part of the thaw in Eastern Europe, there was a considerable shift from Stalinism. Hundreds of thousands of political prisoners were either released or given reduced sentences, and party leaders who had been purged were restored to the party. Some who had been executed were posthumously rehabilitated. That key indicator, pressure to build up collective farms, was reversed. In Hungary, in a single year, May 1953 to May 1954, the acreage under collective farming decreased one-third, while the number of peasants on such farms fell 45%. This was fairly typical of the zone as a whole. The general shift undoubtedly encouraged resistance to Soviet domination, a feeling which was greatly increased in 1956 by three other factors. One, the growing impoverishment of the zone from Soviet exploitation, from the poor crops and food shortages of 1956, and from the equally grave fuel sh shortages, both coal and petroleum. Two, the shift of Soviet attention from Europe to Asia. Three, the unexpected reaction to the secret speech. The consequences of these disturbing influences were general in this zone. But the specific cases of Poland and Hungary hold great interest because they work in such totally different ways. The chief difference, of course, was the great strength of the Polish leaders and people going back to their terrible experiences at the hands of both Russians and Germans and their memoirs of extraordinary feats of the underground resistance. Soviet reactions to Polish demands for liberalizing the regime were undoubtedly influenced by a reluctance to meet the resistance again. However, the chief difference lay in the related fact that the leaders of the Polish community, Communist Party led the demand for liberalization and maintained a united front while doing so, while the Hungary movement was resisted by the party leaders and could be split by personal ambitions. <laughs> The crisis began in both countries in the last week of June 1956. A stoppage of work at the Polish railway factory in Poznan grew into a mass demonstration against the communist regime. Shots were fired and eventually over 50 were killed and 330, 
323 were arrested. Polish Party Secretary uh, Okab made concessions to the opposition and attributed the episode to social roots, the existence of serious disturbances between the party and the various sections of the working class. This was re rejected three days later by Bulganin during a sudden and un unexpected visit of the Kremlin leaders to Warsaw. Their version attributed the troubles to foreign capitalist agitators. Ochab con continued his concessions and on August 4th re readmitted to the party the popular Vladislav Gomulka, a strong nationalist communist who had been removed and imprisoned at Stalin's orders in 1951. Because the continued worsening of economic conditions in the the late summer of 1956 made it impossible for the Polish communists to offer the people any substantial economic concessions. They continued the political relaxation, which alarmed the Kremlin. The, the trials of those arrested in June, in the June disturbances were fair and punishments lenient amid growing nationalist enthusiasm. On October 15th, Moscow learned of a Polish decision to convene the Polish Central Committee on October 18th to elect a new Politburo which would not include Soviet Marshal K.K. Rokossovsky, Defense Minister of Poland since the days of Stalin, and would make Gomolka party secretary. After a hurried meeting of the Soviet president Presidium on October 18th, Soviet troops and na naval contingents began to converge on Poland, and Khrushchev, Molotov, Kaganovich, and Mikoyan burst into the Polish Central Committee session of October 19th just as it began. The presence of this of that rigid Stalinist Molotov, who had been dismissed as foreign secretary in June, was significant of the precarious decline of Khrushchev's position in the Kremlin. Khrushchev, however, acted as a Soviet spokesman at the session in the Bel Belvedere, Bel no, Belvedere Palace. He was violent and bellicose, calling Gamolka a traitor and threatening to threatening dire consequences if the old Politburo, including Rokossovsky, was not reinstated. Okchab, still Polish secretary, was firm and ordered the immediate halt of the Soviet troop advances, or all negotiations would be ended and the Poles would take the consequences. This meant resistance to the Russians by the tough, well-armed Polish security corps. Khrushchev stopped his troop movements, the Russians withdrew, and the session of, of the Polish Central Committee finished its work, electing a new non-Soviet Politburo, which excluded Rokossovsky and made Gamolka secretary. The, later, I mean, the latter, in the course of his discussions with Khrushchev, had indicated that his liberalization would extend only to domestic affairs and would not injure Polish-Soviet friendship or the Warsaw Pact. In his speech to the committee, Gomolka sought to reconcile nationalist communism with the Polish-Soviet friendship and made a severe attack on the cult of personality, with its hideous atrocities under the Stalinist regime. Rokossovsky resigned as defense minister and returned to Russia with more than 30 other Soviet high military officers in November. Khrushchev publicly yielded in the Polish crisis on October 23rd when he issued a statement that he saw no obstacles to relations between the two countries from the committee's actions and that the Soviet troops would be withdrawn to their bases. On the same day, he was taking steps to crush the parallel crisis in Hungary. The troops in the Magyar state in the summer of 1956 took the same forms as in Poland but instead of being directed by the Communist Party secretary, they were directed against him. They appeared as agitations against the indefatigable Stalinist Matthias Rakowski and in favor of the mild Imre Nagy, who had been premier in 1953-55 as Malenkov's choice and had been removed at Khrushchev's order. On July 18th, Khrushchev tried to deflate these agitations by ordering some minor reforms and replacing Rikossi as party secretary by his deputy, the uncouth and obstinate Stalinist Erno Gero. This simply intensified the agitations, <coughs> which rose to the crescendo in September, chiefly from the meetings and re resolutions of the students, workers, and literary groups. Some of their demands were successful, including on October 19th, abolition of the compulsory study of the Russian language. On October 22nd, a meeting of about 4,000 students discussing changes in university life became diverted to political agitations and drew up 16 points, 
which they tried to force Radio Budapest to broadcast. A mission of some of the points, demanding a new economic policy, the withdrawal of Soviet troops, free elections, freedom of press, and reform of the Communist Party, led to a mass demonstration on October 23rd. When Garrow refused their demands, the students began to riot, smashing, two pieces the, smashing to pieces the huge statue of Stalin in the center of the city. The security police killed several demonstrators, but when the regular Hungarian troops were called to restore order, they joined the agitators. By that time, Soviet troops began to move from 50 miles away and arrived in the capital by 2 a.m. On October 24th, Mikoyan had preceded them. It soon became clear that the Soviet tanks could not control the situation because they could be blocked by overturned streetcars or other obstacles and could not subdue rioters in strong buildings. Mikoyan dismissed Giro and put in as party secretary Janos Kadar, until then an, a known opponent of the Stalinist group. By that time, October 25th, the revolt had spread through Hungary under the passive eyes of the Soviet troops. On the following day, Nagy, still in touch with Mikoyan, formed a new government and negotiated a ceasefire. The Russian forces withdrew from Budapest and negotiations were opened between their officers and the, Na the Nagy government for their withdrawal from the country. By that time, the whole communist system in Hungary had collapsed. Unofficial elected groups had seized power throughout the country, the secret police and the party had disintegrated. A revolutionary council had taken control of the Hungarian army, and Colonel Pal Maliter, a leader of the revolt, had been made a major general and minister of defense. Most significant of all, the one-party system had been ended, and members of the revived non-communist parties had joined the cabinet. On October 31st, the official Soviet news agency, TASS, announced that the Kremlin was ready to recognize the new government and negotiated withdrawal of all Soviet troops from the country. However, as October ended, large Soviet forces had begun to invade Hungary, crossing into the country on numerous temporary combat bridges. On November 1st, Kadar, who had pretended to be one of Nagy's closest supporters, fled from Budapest to the Soviet headquarters at uh, Soldnak. There he set up a new government under Soviet control. The same day, Nagy called to the United Nations, appealing for them for help and announcing Hungary's withdrawal from the Warsaw Pact and its resumption of neutrality. In the meantime, the Soviet invasion was in full operation, overrunning the country and smashing into Budapest before dawn on November 4th. Most of the resistance was over overwhelmed that day. As it collapsed, the Nagy government and their families took refuge in the Yugoslav embassy. The Yugoslavs, including Tito, were obviously confused by Kadar's change of sides and accepted his promise of safe conduct to their homes for Nagy and his associates. However, when these people left the security of the embassy on November 22nd, they were seized by Soviet forces and deported to prisons outside Hungary. By that date, the flight of the refugees from Hungary was in flood, despite efforts by the Kadar government to prevent it. Many were killed as they tried to pass the frontiers, but thousands escaped to the west, where many of them were able to continue their studies in a new way of life. The costs of the uprising were catastrophic. On the Hungarian side, there were about 2,800 killed, 13,000 wounded, and 4,000 buildings destroyed. But tens of thousands were in exile or in hiding. The country was shattered and lay as a conquered country under the armed forces of its oppressor. <laughs> The unanticipated consequences of Khrushchev's de-Stalinization efforts in Eastern Europe were bound to injure Khrushchev in the Kremlin power struggle. Indeed, they brought him to the brink of final disaster early in 1957. As usual, the shifts of power were indicated by changes in personnel. Kaganovich, who had been removed from the government on June 5, 1957, was restored as Minister of Building Materials on September 22nd. Shepilov, who had been Khrushchev's appointee as foreign minister in June, lost his other post as secretary to the Center Central Committee on Christmas Day 1956. Above all, on November 22nd, Molotov was made minister of the state, a post which had uh, budgetary functions in all parts of the state-controlled economy and could have been built up into a state power in opposition to Khrushchev's party power and the economic system. Moreover, de-Stalinization ceased after July 1956, and even Khrushchev found it necessary to praise the old ogre, 
On December 23rd, Pravda denied that there had ever been any Stalinism in the Soviet Union. Eight days later, Khrushchev said, We can state with contrition that we are all Stalinists, in fact. On January 17, 1957, at the Chinese embassy in Mos Moscow, he said, Stalinism, like Stalin himself, is insepar inseparable from communism. In the fight against the enemy of our class, Stalin defended the cause of Marxism-Leninism. For Khrushchev, as for all the Soviet leaders, the great issue was to pre prevent t Titoism from spreading into the Soviet Union and, if possible, to curtail its spread among the satellites. Every effort was made to prevent knowledge of the Polish October and the Hungarian revolt from reaching the Soviet people, and the attacks on Tito and Yugoslavia were resumed. Tito struck back on November 11th with the charge that Stalin had taken the domestic and foreign policies of the Soviet Union to dead ends, and that his error errors were not personal ones but intrinsic in the Soviet system of monolithic authoritarianism. He was refuted in Pravda a week later. <clears throat> the Hungarian invasion destroyed much of the appeal of communism to the leftists of Western Europe and the world. <clears throat> this has already been left in shreds by the secret speech. Even the Soviet Union, university students and intellectuals disapproved of the Soviet invasion of Hungary. Many literary works were written during the de-Stalinization phase in the spring uh, were published the following winter. When the tide had turned again, Khrushchev struck hard at these groups and continued to do so for several years, with the result that the alienation of Russian intellectuals from Khrushchev became established. This was reflected in the expulsion from the universities later in 1956 of hundreds of students who refused to applaud the Soviet attack on Hungary. The official Soviet line was that most disturbances of this kind arose from the activities of foreign agitators of capitalist aggressors. Simultaneously, the Soviet political and intellectual reaction after J June 1956 came a series of efforts to alienate the economic stringency. Wages were raised, taxes reduced on the poorest payers, social benefits were extended, and the labor unions were urged to protect them. Numerous projects in heavy industry under the five-year plan were slowed up and their resources diverted to consumer goods. Most significant of all, there, were, there was a sharp increase in the influence of state officials and corresponding decrease in that of party officials. This reversal was fully evident in the Central Committee session of late, of, of late December 1956, but the following meeting in February 1957 showed Khrushchev in, a, in an aggressive counterattack. This took the form of suggestions for a drastic reorganization of Soviet economic life toward a more decentralized system. Undoubtedly, this plan had considerable merit, but in Khrushchev's eyes it had an additional advantage, since it would remove much of the economic life from the influence of the central state ministries and leave it open to increased influence from po local political groups. He proposed the division of the Soviet Union, Union into several dozen economic regions, each under an economic council, or Sovnarkozy, Sar of diverse groups and the devolution to these groups of the economic functions of the majority of the economic ministries in Moscow. These ministries would be abolished along with the State Commission for Current Planning, GEK, and Molotov's Ministry of State Control. This would leave only the Long Range Economic Planning Agency, Gosplan, and a few economic ministries at the center, with annual planning and most execution left to the regional or lower groupings. <coughs> This plan had real merits, which can hardly be covered here. Clearly, the growing complexity of the Soviet economy over a widely diverse terrain of, and, and people could not be operated efficiently by uniform regulations from the center. Moreover, each economic ministry, because of the constant shortages of resources, materials, and labor, sought to build up within itself its own sources of supply and also had a constant urge to hoard equipment and parts even when they were not needed by it and were urgently needed by enterprises of a different ministry in the next street or district. This hampered expansion and also resulted in very expensive cross-hauling of the freight of one ministry from remote areas at the very time that a different ministry might be hauling similar resources in the opposite direction. The serious overworking of a Soviet railway system, a constant weakness in the economy, was a tense, intensified such needless hauling intensified by such needless hauling. In spite of its merits, the anti-K group and the 
Presidium was unwilling to adopt this reform because it would drastically weaken centralized state control and strengthen localized party control in the Soviet economy. The state hierarchy of Soviets had fallen into decay, partly because of Stalin's use of the party and secret police, partly as a means to avoid use of the fraudulently democratic Soviet, Soviet constitution and of its federal, federalist features. As a consequence, the state hierarchy lacked effective or flexible control down through its levels, while the party hierarchy had these well developed. Much of the state's power locally was exercised through the economic ministries, while Khrushchev now wished to abolish, which Khrushchev now wished to abolish. And because of his control of the party and through it of the party press headed by Pravda, Khrushchev could keep up a steady drum of propaganda for his economic reorganization. Every local figure was for it, and it appeared to other rival leaders as an anti-state move. Khrushchev, on the other hand, could make the opposite uh, the opposition seemed anti-party, with all the treasonable overtones Stalin had given to that expression. The economic reorganization law was passed on May 10, 1957, abolishing 25 economic ministries, retaining 19, and devolving their functions to 29 regional so uh, sub the, the The state economic commission, GEK, was also ab abolished, leaving as the only central economic control the state committee for long-term planning under Yosef Kuzmin a Khrushchev party official, who simultaneously became first deputy prime minister of the Soviet Union. Sheplov was restored to the secretaryship of the Central Committee, which he had lost in December. These, charges, these changes were pushed through by an alliance of the party, the army, and all the forces of localism, but both economic and state. Khrushchev had won a great victory, which could make the party dominant in economic life. Having failed to block Khrushchev's economic plans, his rivals in the Presidium were reduced to a last resort. They had to get rid of the man himself. On June 18th, at the meeting of the Presidium, the motion was made to remove Khrushchev as first party secretary. The discussion grew violent, with Malenkov and Molotov attacking and Khrushchev defending himself. He was accused of practicing a cult of personality of his own of ideological aberrations which threatened the solidarity of communism and of economic mismanagement. It soon became clear that the vote was 7-4 against him, with Mikoyan, Kirichenko, and Suslov his only supporters. He was offered the reduced position of Minister of Agriculture. Khrushchev refused to accept the result, denying that the Presidium had authority to remove the first secretary and appealing to the Central Committee. The members of this larger group joined in the discussion as they arrived, while Khrushchev's supporters sought to delay a final vote until his men could come in from their party posts in the provinces. Marshal Zukov provided army plans to bring in the more distant and more reliable ones. The discussion became bitter, especially when Zukov threatened to produce documentary evidence that Malenkov, Molotov, and Kaganovich had been deeply involved in the bloody purges of 1937. Madame Fortseva, who was, like Zukov, an alternate member of the Presidium, filibustered with a speech of six hours. Surprisingly, Khrushchev's agent Shepilov spoke against him, but M. A. Suslov, the head of the security police and the most cold-blooded killer left in the Soviet Union, shifted to Khrushchev's side. Eventually, there were 309 members present, with 215 wanting the floor, over 60 actually making speeches. When the vote was finally taken, Khrushchev's loyal supporters in the party hierarchy voted for him solidly, and his removal, already voted by the Presidium, was reversed. Khrushchev at once counterattacked. He moved and carried the expulsion from the Presidium of Malenkov, Molotov, Kaganovich, and Sheplov for anti-party activities. Then came the election of a new Presidium, from which Pervukhim and uh, Saburov, the two strongest supporters of a centralized state-controlled economy, were also removed. Perk uh, Pervukhim uh, became an alternate member, but Saburov was dropped completely. The new Presidium had 15 full members instead of the previous 11, and 9 alternate members instead of 6. The old al alternate members, Zukov, Fert Fertseva, Eli Brez Brezhnev, and N.M. Shvernik, who had supported Khrushchev, were moved up to be full members, joining the holdovers Khrushchev, Bolganin, Kirchenko, Mikoyan, Suslov, Voroshilov, while five loyal agents of Khrushchev, led by Aristov and F.R. Kozlov, were added. This change in July 23, 1957 was
Khrushchev's most smashing personal victory and the most significant event in Russia's internal history after the death of Stalin. It led Khrushchev to a position of political power more complete, except for the ambiguous position of the army, than Stalin's had been. Although it was clear that Khrushchev would never be allowed to abuse his power the way Stalin had done, Khrushchev did not rest on his oars. During the summer of 1957, he made notable concessions to the peasants, especially the ending of compulsory deliveries from the products of their own of their personal plots. Slammed down the lid on freedom of writers and artists with a strict cultural directive of August 28th, pushed vigorously both the virgin lands scheme and the decentralization of industry, and worked to, worked to curtail the growing autonomy of the armed forces. On October 27th, while Zakov was in Albania, he was removed from the Ministry of Defense and at the same time was dropped from the Central Committee because of unsatisfactory co cooperation with the party's political work in the army. The next few months saw a twofold advance of party influence on a lesser scale into the army and on a greater scale, both directly and through the intermediary of the revived trade unions into their new regional economic councils. The final cap of Khrushchev's rise to power came in the spring of 1958. Following the elections and assembly of the new Supreme Soviet on March 28th, Bulganin resigned as premier and was replaced by Khrushchev. In the autumn, Bulganin, who had cooperated so well with the new autocrats' rise to power, was expelled from the presidium and condemned as an enemy of the party. This left this left Khrushchev as complete ruler of the Soviet Union, head of both state and party, as Stalin had been, but resting his power more on the latter than on the former. In the five years following Stalin's death, military strategy in the Soviet Union underwent a major debate almost as confused as, sim as the simultaneous debate going on in the U.S. during Eisenhower's presidency. On the whole, the range of theories of war, both stri strategic and tactical, was much less in the Soviet Union than in the U.S., and changes have been much slower. But the basic issues were the same. The orthodox milita military ideas of the Russians, like everywhere else, had been stated by Stalin and were not allowed to change under the impact of new ideas or of new weapons until after his death. Thus, Stalin orthodoxy regarded war as str a struggle between whole societies, each with its distinctive way of life, and judged that the outcome would be determined by what was called the permanently operating factors. These factors emphasized the characteristics of the society, such as industrial strength, morale, level of training, and reserve forces. Other accidental factors, such as weather, surprise, ability of individual commanders, even Napoleon, or the outcome of single battles, were regarded as of little significance. Accordingly, the Russians had no faith in lightning wars or strategic bombing or in new or, above all, absolute weapon, weapons. To them, victory was achieved by destruction of the enemy's armed forces by a series of blows and conflicts over a long time, during which the permanent factors, especially the forces of industrial strength and national morale, would be decisive. <clears throat> they regarded attacks on the enemy's population, cities, or industri industry as wasted effort, except where these could be directly linked to battle, and each battle would be determined by a balance of forces from all branches of the de of the defense services per persistently concentrating on the enemy forces over extensive time and space. In this outlook, there was no place for the nuclear bomb, for strategic air attack, or for 24-hour wars, and accordingly, the American possession of the A-bomb was largely ignored. Protests against its use and the desire to outlaw it were undoubtedly based on the fact that it was an American monopoly. But the Russian objection to city bombing or to strategic terror of the V-2 kind as ineffective and a waste of resources was undoubtedly sincere. Soviet efforts to get the A-bomb and the H-bomb to build up a fleet of Tu-4s were partly a desire to possess what the enemy had, partly based on a desire to deter our use of the SAC against Russia, and partly derived from Stalin's astonishment at the damage our strategic bombers had inflicted on Berlin, but none of these had much influence on Soviet military thinking. A change in strategic thinking arose in 1954 as a consequence of a debate among Soviet military leaders over the role of surprise in military victory. The possibility of a sudden American nuclear attack on Russia from the air had to be examined. As a consequence of this dispute, the role of surprise was considerably increased, although there was no general feeling that it could be decisive or even that wars might be shortened as a result of nuclear weapons. 
To this day, the Soviet leaders still believe that victory will go to their country after a long war of mass forces using a balance of all arms and weapons. But they now include in this balance of weapons nuclear arms at all stages and ranges. However, they do not believe, as many Americans do, that strategic bombing can be decisive. It is simply an additional arm added on to the older ar arsenal and will be used in war against the military objectives primarily because wars are fought with the military sectors of a society. As a consequence of these views, the Soviet Union has no idea of being able to achieve military victory over the U.S. simply because they do not have a because they have no method of occupying the territory of the United States at any stage in war. They hope to defeat the U.S. as a society by nonviolent means, propaganda, subversion, economic collapse, and diplomatic isolation. If the rivalry with the U.S. comes to the violent stage, they have every hope that the Soviet Union itself will not be directly involved but can wear the United States down by fighting through third parties, as in Korea. The Russians generally rejected the idea of mutual annihilation or the total destruction of all civilization in war, and insist that any war, however se severe, will leave some remnant of the Soviet Union surviving as victor on the field. They accept the possibility of limited war in a geographical sense, but have little hope of any war limited to non-nuclear non weapons, because this would be, they feel, to their advantage and accordingly not acceptable to us. Thus, they are unlikely to use nuclear weapons first, although fully prepared to resort to them once they are used by an, en an enemy. One confusing consequence of the Soviet discussion of the role of surprise in war was an effort to disti distinguish between preventative and preemptive war. Because the generals, planners, and staff theorists were convinced that the West must be aggressive because of the contradictions of the capitalist economic system, they were convinced that they were in danger of a surprise attack by SAC. Their weakness in this aspect of war made it unlikely that their retaliatory strike would be of decisive significance since they developed a theory of preemptive strike. This said that if they would counter surprise or surprise attack by beating us to the punch with a nuclear attack of their own. Such a preemptive strike would be justified only on the basis of conclusive evidence that we were about to launch a surprise attack, since our retaliatory strike after their preemptive strike would still be very damaging to them. The problem arises, however, as to how they can ever be sure that we are about to attack them, and failing that, how does such a preemptive war differ from a preventative war? which the Soviet abjures because it is unnecessary to them. Soviet military thinkers have been very reluctant to accept any theories of nuclear deterrence or of limited war under an umbrella of nuclear deterrence. Since war is a struggle to the death by antipathetical societies, such societies will, in war, use any weapons they have. Accordingly, the Soviet unions believe that any general war involving the U.S. and themselves would be a nuclear war in which their ground forces with tactical air support and nuclear weapons of all sizes and ranges would fight its way overland against nuclear-armed enemies to occupy most of Europe and possibly Asia. They believe that there are three defenses against tactical nuclear weapons. <clears throat> Dispersal of their own forces as widely as possible until the last moment before assault. 2. Contact as rapidly and as closely as possible with the enemy in order to deter the enemy from use of nuclear weapons, which would also destroy its own forces. 3. Protection of as many of their troops as possible under cover, usually in tanks. The first two of these place great emphasis on rapid mobility of troops, and the third helps to provide this. Accordingly, the Russians anticipate the use of many, if not entirely, armored forces in overrunning Europe and very extensive use of air transport of troops with conventional planes, gliders, and helicopters. Such mobility will allow Europe to be overrun rapidly, creating a situation which they feel will make a victory for the West impossible, while our strategic attack on Soviet Union itself will be reduced and eventually end ended by strong defensive measures and retaliation. However, such a war would, which would uh, jeopardize the communist way of life by threatening the Soviet Union, uh, its only accurate embodiment, is regarded by the Soviet leaders as highly undesirable and to be avoided at almost any cost. While they, in a period of almost endless cold war, can seek to destroy capitalist society by nonviolent means or by local violence of third parties, this theory of nibbling the capitalist world to death is combined with a tactic which would resist capital 
capitalist imperialism by encouraging anti-colonialism. Such a change called forth on the part of the U.S. A, def a defensive tactic which shifted from Dulles's insistence that the uncommitted nations must join the West to the more moderate aim of keeping them from becoming communist. This shift in aims in reference to the uncommitted nations occurred both in the Soviet Union and in the United States and is of major importance in, in creating the contemporary world. Stalin and Dulles saw the world largely in black and white terms. Who was not with them was obviously against them. Accordingly, the world must be either slave or free, each man uh, applying the former adjective to his opponent's side and the more favorable latter term to his own group. They were enemies, but they agreed basically that the world must be a two-power system. They meant that each was aggressive in terms of the uncommitted nations because they in because each insisted they must either join his own side or be regarded and treated as an, en an enemy. The great change which occurred in the middle of in the middle 1950s was that both of the superpowers had to recognize that most of the uncommitted nations were too weak, too backward, and too independent, independent to be forced to be either capitalist or communist. They had to be something different, something of their own. This view was forced upon the superpowers with perhaps greater difficulty in Washington than in the Kremlin, but it was an aspect of reality which had to be re recognized. <clears throat> From it came the acceptance of neutralism and the rise of the buffer fringe. This shift was a double one. On the one hand, it meant that the superpowers' attitudes toward the buffer fringe shifted from basically offensive one to a basically defensive one, shifted from an effort to get them to join one's own side to an effort to keep them from joining the other opponent's side. The opponent side. And at the same time, it, it marked the first beginnings of true wisdom and true hope for the world's future in the recognition that there are more than two alternative fashions for organizing a functioning economic, social, and political system. In the long run, this recognition would be a victory for the West, for the West has always, in its real nature, recognized that reality is diverse and is pluralist. While it has been the Russian way to insist that reality is dualistic, with each extreme necessar necessarily mon monistic and uniform, the acceptance of diversity and of pluralism by the inevitable failure of both capitalism and communism in the buffer fringe has forced the West to accept and apply its own often unrecognized traditions. Moreover, the forcing of this recognition upon both the Soviet Union and the West in respect to the buffer fringe may have the consequence in time of forcing each of these to accept in its it in respect to their internal systems. Here again, this would mark a great victory for the West because the acceptance of diversity and pluralism is part of the tradition of the West and is not acceptable to Russia, whose traditions have always been basically dualistic, seeing reality as a contrast between the unattainable ideal of perfection and a horrible, sinful morass of ordinary living. The, imperfection is, the imperfections of the latter being acceptable as a necessary consequence of the unattainability of the former, with both extremes being uniform in one. Such an acceptance will reduce the tension of the Cold War by allowing each polar superpower to, to develop features of a mixed system which will make them approach each other in their characteristics of organization, a development which is, of course, already apparent to any unbiased observer. The shift from dualism to pluralism and from uniformity to diversity was forced upon the Soviet Union in its most critical form by the rise of Titoism. This, of course, was chiefly evident in Europe, where conditions of industrial development make it more reasonable for Kremlin leaders to expect the Soviet example to be followed slavishly by non-capitalist states. The same lesson should, however, have been learned even earlier in Asia, because there it became evident to many observers that most nations were neither able to, nor willing to follow either the Soviet Union or the U.S. This observation, however, was impossible under Stalin because his false theories of the nature of both capitalism and imperialism made him regard the two as identical, and thus to regard colonial areas as being parts of the capitalist system. As a consequence of these intellectual errors, the Kremlin, under Stalin, was prepared to see the fringes of Asia either continuing as colonial areas or breaking away from European domination to become communist zones, but it did not see the possibility of them becoming non-communist and non-colonial Independent, independent states. This meant that where Stalin intervened in certain areas of Asia, he intervened on behalf of the microscopic communist parties and rebuffed the local native nationalist anti-colonialist groups.
Khrushchev, as we shall see, did the opposite. Stalin's policy was quite bankrupt even before his death, and it was thus fairly easy for his successors to abandon it and to adopt a more feasible policy of communist co cooperation with local anti-colonial and thus largely anti-Western forces to detach them as a new, independent, but still non-communist nations from the West. The Soviet assistance to such uh, new nations was largely economic, although the limited productivity of the Soviet Union's own economic system, especially in food, made a, any, any substantial foreign aid to neutral nations a considerable burden on the Soviet Union itself. For this reason, much of the burden of such foreign aid was pushed onto the Soviet satellite states, especially Czechoslovakia. This shift in Soviet attitude toward neutralism was helped by Dulles' refusal to accept the existence of neutralism. His rebuffs tended to drive those areas which wanted to be neutral into the arms of Russia because the new nations of the developing buffer fringe valued their independence above all else. The Russian acceptance of neutralism may be dated about 1954, while Dulles, uh, Dulles still felt strongly adverse to neutralism four or five years later. This gave, Soviet, this gave the Soviet Union a chrono chronological advantage, which served in some small degree to compensate for its many disadvantages in the basic struggle to win the favor of the neutrals. While these changes were occurring, the strategic debate in the Soviet Union continued. In this subject, also, the fact that the Soviet Union was straining its economic resources was of great import importance. The demands of the unsuccessful Soviet agricultural program made it necessary to put more and more manpower into agriculture at the very time that the demands of the defense effort and civilian economy and the rampant waste and inefficiency in the Soviet system were increasing the demands for manpower in industry. Moreover, the heavy casualties of the period 1928-45 from purges and warfare had reduced the population figures and the birth rate to such a degree that the Soviet population figures, even in 1970, would be tens of millions below normal. The only source from which such demands for manpower could be met in the conventionally armed units of the Soviet defense forces was in the conventionally armed units. As a consequence of these conditions, the Soviet defense strategy debate from 1955 onward took a form somewhat parallel to that going on in the U.S. That is, some of the political leaders, including Khrushchev, began to force upon the Soviet military leaders a shift in emphasis from mass conventional forces toward greater reliance upon strategic bombers and missiles. Khrushchev's version of the Eisenhower New Look, in which the latter's Big Bang for a Buck, was played by a Soviet version of More Rubble for a Ruble was adopted by Soviet Chief of Staff Marshal Sokolovsky and less vigorously by Defense Minister Marshal Mali Malinovsky. The former view was stated in a widely read book, Military Strategy, published in Moscow in September 1962. But it is quite clear that the military leaders were prepared to yield s slowly to Khrushchev and other political leaders. The net result seems uh, likely to be a mixed one, somewhat similar to the similar struggle in the United States. The chief difference is that Soviet production and wealth is so much less than that of the U.S. that all such critical decisions must be made within much narrower perimeters. Per, parameters. In spite of these limitations of resources and demonstrations of inexperience and lack of competence parallel to that of the U.S., the impact of this superpower, superpowers was tremendous, tremendous, especially in the East, Eastern and Southern Asia and in the Near East.